What's going on, guys? Welcome back to Before the Whistle. I'm your host, Maddie Hudak, and I'm here to break down the Green Wave's 24-22 to win over the Tulsa Golden Hurricane in a battle of very interesting logos, uh, including mascots as Tulsa traveled with theirs to make Tulane 9-1 on the year, undefeated in conference play, and off to a better start than they were last year, despite, uh, I think, all of the criticisms, I think some of which are fair, some of which lack a lot of context in this victory for the Green Wave, but... The fact of the matter is Tulane has figured out a winning formula. It just might not be in the way that fans want to see. Uh, and sure, you had a little bit more style last year, I guess. Um, I think a lot of that came from Tajay Spears, and it just can't be understated how crucial and unbelievable it is that Tulane's been able to find someone like Makai Hughes just on the heels of losing Tajay Spears. We talk about all this turnover on the field, especially with respect to last year. And I just want to take a minute and really go through that. Uh, you lose, I mean, your top receivers in Shea Wyatt and Deuce Watts. You lose your blocking tight end, Will Wallace. You're receiving tight end and Tyreek James. You have younger guys in Alex Bauman and Reggie Brown, who had a little bit of a role on the offense last year, but you almost don't really see their counterparts this year in guys like Blake Gunter, for example, until this game, where you are also missing Chris Carter, who's been both a receiving and blocking tight end for Tulane who unfortunately had a funeral for a family member to attend and miss this matchup. Uh, so then you lose Tajay Spears at running back. You lose your left tackle and you have a new offensive line coach. You have, I guess, a new named OC in title, uh, although Slade Nagel was calling the plays for Tulane last year. You have the same tight ends coach. Your running back coach and coach Sherman moved over to wide receivers. And now you have a new running back coach. And then let's go to the defense here. Um, probably the least amount of turnover on the defensive line, but you get a new defensive line coach. You have a new defensive coordinator in Shield Wood, who is also the team's new linebacker coach, responsible for coaching up the guys that have taken the place of Nick Anderson, Dorian Williams, and then the loss of Corey Platt. I just have to keep shouting out that trio of linebackers and small grubs and Machado. Machado made so many tackles again. Uh, Jared Small had another huge third down stop and Tyler Grubbs with another sack on the day and a key one at that. Then you have a new anchors coach, which was the nickel position last year. You have a new player playing that role and you have new guys at both starting and free safety. And that's just an astonishing amount of turnover. You also have a new special teams coach, which you can throw into the mix uh, and shout out to special teams for being nothing short of incredible for Tulane in this game. Uh, and you almost feel like there was a game like this coming all year where special teams would really have to pull out that third phase of the game. And I'm going to go back to the Southern Miss loss last year. Just to give a little perspective here, the team was really injured at that time last year. I know Michael Pratt was battling through injuries. They had some uh, injuries at both receiver and tight end where you saw Alex Bauman kind of have to really step up in this role and you end up seeing them lose. You don't end up seeing them being able to pull away with that last year. And it was a loss to, you know, I think you'd say a worse opponent than who Tulane has lost to this year. Uh, Tulane heading into Tulsa, I'd say, was the most injured that they've been all season. And I know that's not an excuse for things, but to ignore that in the context of everything that's going on here would just be a little short-sighted to me uh, because you faced ECU last week, who had probably the ru best rush defense you're going to face all season. Uh, and not to mention, Makai Hughes still becomes the third rusher all season to get over 100 yards uh, on them. He rushes for another consecutive game uh, of rushing yards. And... Tulane ends up being able to get it done one way or another. Uh, there are teams where things don't go well. And a lot of the time winning comes down to health, opportunity, and luck. Uh, those are the top three things for me. And Tulane, if you ask me, has not really been winning in two of those metrics, especially heading into this game, in both luck and injury. I think injury and luck can kind of get slipped into, um, you know, another, but Everyone, I think, in this, these discussions about these close losses or close wins, if you will, also could say that it's really short of being a close loss, where if something went wrong, then this would happen. Uh, if you ask me, I think a lot of things have gone wrong for Tulane. Um, they haven't been able to convert key situations. They've turned the ball over in, in bad times, and yet they're still able to pull out that 1-0 mentality week after week and don't appear to be phased at any point in time. And you felt like, again, in that Southern Miss loss last year, you felt the loss of personnel and special teams, you could argue, lost the game for them in a three-point loss where you had a blocked punt, a blocked field goal, and a missed field goal on the day. Valentino did not miss. Uh, they said something about a consecutive 
extra points made. It's something wild. It was like 138 or something, which I hate those types of records, but it just goes to show you how consistent he's been. He made all of his field goals that he was able to make on the day, but special teams, I remember there was this wild punt by Will Carroll where I got blinded by looking up so high into the sky, trying to locate this. And then Tulane gets the biggest special teams boost I'd say all year and really reminiscent of the Memphis homecoming win last year for them, where Shedra Lewis returned a kick for a touchdown tied the longest in school history. I believe it was the first time since 2018 or 2019 for a hundred yards. And if, if that's what you have to score and win a football game, who really cares to an extent? I'm going to go through these uh, halves a little bit, but I, it just, as someone that covered the NFL and watched the NFL for the majority of my life, I really didn't follow along with college football until I joined Tulane as radio crew, as a sideline reporter. And it's just been a really interesting experience to me to watch how many things differ. I think a lot of it comes down to psychology and game planning, especially with these new clock control rules. But this idea of style points, no one cares in the NFL if you win in overtime, if you win by a point, two points. It's not really discussed to the degree that it is in college football. And I get that there are rankings and, and those types of things that exist in college football that don't exist in the NFL, but it does get a little hoopla feeling to me when you just keep talking about these things. And then you look at the way that Tulane again continues to end games. And I don't want to get ahead of myself, but Makai Hughes falling down at the end of the game when there's arguably a chance he gets that touchdown. I think that's such a selfless move that really speaks to the identity of this Tulane team this year. And one that's just concerned with winning every game in front of them and getting on to the next week and preparing for that opponent. That has culminated in a 9-1 and one victory. The idea of sustained success is happening. We are in the midst of sustained success as much as people might not feel that way. To go 12-2 and two and have the biggest single season turnaround in college football history deserves its own accolades. The biggest question was, will Tulane be able to follow that up with any type of consistency? And that's been the thing that Coach Fritz, when he came here in 2016, really touted was the idea of sustaining success winning consistently, and that's how you build a program. You know, when guys like Nick Anderson talked about leaving a legacy and a timeline last year, they weren't just talking about the Cotton Bowl season. The whole idea was setting the standard of excellence so teams in the future look back and don't just say, oh, the 2022 football team won the Cotton Bowl. They set the standard of what it means to be a Tulane football team and a program. And you're seeing Tulane literally pull that off, have a better start than they did last year, and yet there is still so much discontent. So I'm going to go through the context of this game and hopefully get our heads screwed on a little more straight heading into week 11 of this season that is all but flown by to me. <laughs> now, again, I don't want to just get in the business of explaining away things because I know that there is a fair question about a team when you look at Tulsa that they came into this game scoring, you know, 10 points on average against season opponents that were putting up 40 plus points on them, common opponents at that for Tulane with Rice beating them 48 to 10 and then SMU beating them 69 to 10. I think lost to the context of that is a, the confusion that just exists in a type of quarterback system that Tulsa has been running where perhaps a lot more credibly than one would expect. They've been trying out multiple quarterbacks and all of them have such different skill sets that just to even have to spend the time that week preparing for the possibility of to start the week four of them. Uh, one of their better players at quarterback ended up being hurt for this game. And so you really only saw them use Kirk Francis and Braylon Braxton, but they fe they faced Braxton before. You know that you have the run threat with him. You weren't really expecting with Francis, but you knew he was probably their best passer out there. But to have a different play call sheet for every single quarterback, something that also stuck out to me earlier in this week, Michael Pratt, when he was talking to media on Tuesday, he mentioned that every single conference opponent that Tulane has faced this year has given them a different look that they have not seen yet on film. That is the utmost sign of respect that you can get from your conference. It also, again, puts a lot of things into perspective of how much of an uphill battle every game really is. And when your quarterback's saying that in week 10, that's a long time for a team to reserve their kind of best playbook. And it sticks out to me again when I'm charting these plays during games that all of a sudden there's a wide receiver that hadn't caught a pass all year for them who had two receptions in the second half for Tulsa. Uh, so to have, again, the changing of the hand at quarterback, to have every team in your conference be saving their best game plan for you, having to figure it out, re adjust literally on the fly in a conference of opponents where 50% of them are new teams and 50% of them have first-time head coaches, 
in their role. That's just so much turnover. Um, just going back through the last couple games, the only ones that have offered any form of consistency are Tulsa and Memphis in teams Tulane's played before. Uh, yeah, they played UAB in 2021, but North Texas, UAB, Rice, and now FAU this week. I mean, these are all teams that Tulane's just not used to playing. You know, at least you knew what you were getting in John Rice Plumley and teams like UCF, Cincinnati, Houston, where you'd spent years now building up this type of research. It's just easier said than done having to go back to square one and then have every team be throwing their best shot at you. So I hope that gives a little bit of the context to these closer victories, but to go to this game, I mean, you look at the 13 to 10 win in ECU, uh, the defense allowed 10 points in the first quarter. They allowed a zero points and 47 total yards after the fact, whereas they're only able to score 13 points against the best run defense in the conference. So you expect them to be able to put up more points against Tulsa. Uh, they almost doubled that point margin. Yeah. The defense gave up a lot of points, but most of them were on bad angles and explosive plays that if you had an offense that was running at full speed, the point margin, I don't believe would be as close and you still have a defense that makes the stops when it needs to. And I just keep going back again to this idea that in the NFL, I'm just not used to people caring this much about how teams close out games uh, and not going for kind of those style points, especially when you consider the fact that Tulane's in the driver's seat right now in a way that they weren't at this time last year. This time last year, they lost to UCF in this exact same week. And then they had to wait for Navy to kind of throw a miracle their way, beat UCF. And it was still this kind of foot race to the end where Tulane wasn't in control of their own destiny. I mean, they are this year. It just might not look as pretty, but going into this game, it, it just stuck out the amount of injuries that Tulane has suffered on the offensive line this year. That was supposed to be a point of strength and consistency for Michael Pratt in having four of the five returning guys on that line, the only guy that they had to replace being Joey Clayburgh at left tackle. They bring in Cameron Wire, a transfer from LSU, who was hurt briefly during this game. We saw Matt Lombardi have to come in for a series at left tackle. Uh, Sincere Hainsworth has been the only other consistent anchor for this offensive line, an offensive line that has had weeks of a quarterback competition, weeks of quarterback injuries. And then when you get Michael Pratt, then your offensive line starts to get injured. Prince Pines had missed the last five games at left tackle due to, to an elbow injury. Shadri Hurst had been performing really well in his place at left guard. And then uh, I believe in the Memphis game, if I'm correct, or maybe it was a game after that, Josh Rumatich at some point goes down at right guard. So then you had Trey Tuggle coming in playing right guard and you had Rashad Green at right tackle. Uh, this game Rashad Green gets hurt at right tackle so Trey Tuggle who had been playing right guard for the past couple of games moves over to right tackle Shadre Hurst moves over from left guard to right guard for the first time and then Prince Pines returns at left guard and yeah now you have three starters on that side and in, in wire Pines and Hainsworth but it's so many moving parts and again just the amount of versatility on the offensive line to be able to have a guy like Shadre Hurst credibly step in at both left and right guard and have someone like Trey Tuggle be able to do the same at right guard and right tackle. I mean, it just should not go understated how not apples to apples each one of those, those roles is. And it really speaks again to the coaching and the depth there. But in the NFL and really in college too, the line of scrimmage wins and loses you football games. And this amount of turnover in the NFL really spells trouble for guys on uh, the offensive line and for the entire offense as a whole. And you really didn't see that be that big of an issue in this game. It's just something that I think is necessary to mention. Then you're missing Chris Carter, who has been a really key tight end, both in the blocking and the passing game, arguably with a catch of the game in Memphis over his head. And then you're missing Jaquan Jackson and Shoddy Clayton Johnson, who had a great game against ECU heading into this matchup. Um, then during the game, Lawrence Keyes goes down in the first quarter and you'll keep Brown who is battling a couple things going into this game. You saw him come in for one series, and I don't recall him seeing him in there after the fact. So you're down Lawrence Keyes, Jaquan Jackson, Yo Keith Brown, Chris Carter as receiving options for this game. And I would add in Shoddy Clayton Johnson as a receiver who has five receptions this year. Uh, I looked it up, and before this game, this team had 149 catches. Those players were responsible for 58% of them, and I would gander to say quite a bit of the touchdowns as well. So to lose that just can't be understated. Um, And the way Tulane started out this game, 
they won every margin in the first quarter. And the first quarter was when they were the closest to full strength. I'd say they were all game because they also had an injury to Angelo Anderson on the defensive line, one that's still missing Adonis Freelu as a depth piece, several weeks running now on the defensive side. But the Tulane defense starts out, Jarius Monroe makes an interception on the opening possession for them. And then Tulane goes on a 12 play 70 yard drive that eats up five minutes on the clock. And they end up scoring a touchdown. Again, this was a series where you saw Lawrence Keyes in there for almost every single play. It was majority Chris Brazel, Bryce Bohannon, and Lawrence Keyes. They ran 11 personnel all the way until the end zone, switching off between Alex Bauman and Reggie Brown at that tight end roll. Then you saw them get a little creative going into the end zone where they brought in Caleb Thomas as an extra O lineman. They were in, you know, 21 personnel at one point. There were 12 personnel uh, with those two tight ends all unbalanced on that one side. And it was almost kind of like, yeah, we're showing our cards. We dare you to stop it. It's kind of the same thing when the Saints bring Taysom Hill out there. And it ended up in a touchdown with just back-to-back runs from Makai Hughes, where at some point during the series, you know, kind of nicks his head open behind his ear, had to go off to the locker room and get stitches after that play. Then Tulsa, they, you know, it's not three and out. They got a first down with a 29-yard explosive run due to a missed tackle on their first play. Uh, and just a really good job blocking by their offensive line. And then you saw the ball skills really pay off by these defensive backs where Jarius Monroe, second series in a row, pass breakup on third down, gives Tulane the ball back. They only run four plays and have to punt it as well at this point. You had Makai Hughes in the locker room. You still had Lawrence Keyes for this series, but the runs just didn't, you know, Shadra uh, Lewis had a good 16-yard run on the first play of that series, but you were missing Makai Hughes. Absolutely. Then Tulsa, again, the defense holds them three and out on the next play. And it's a largely Cam Pettis blow who makes a stop for no gain on a run tackle and then a tackle for loss on a pass play after that. Tulane capitalizes on that, scores again. They go up 14-0, to zero, and I think everyone's feeling a-, a little good about this game. And that's where the first quarter ends, where they outgain them in yards 160-50. to 50. They outgain them in rush yards 78-48, to 91-2 to two in pass yards. They had eight first downs, five by rush, three by pass, and Tulsa had two. They had 21 plays to Tulsa's 13. Time of possession, Tulane had it for nine minutes and 31 seconds. Zero turnovers for Tulane, one for Tulsa, and seven points off of that turnover. It's as good of a th- first quarter start as you could ask. Uh, that uh, touchdown drive at the end of the first quarter was when Lawrence Keyes, you didn't see him at all. You did see Yo Keith Brown in for, I believe, the only drive of this entire game. Uh, if I'm seeing this correctly, this is when you started to see Luke Besh at wide receiver get lo- worked in a little bit. Alex Bauman steps up really in that series and Bryce Bohannon shout out to him. He had one catch on the season and doubled that output by the end of the first quarter and was a leading receiver for Tulane today uh, on the day. And then they go to the second quarter where they lose in every metric in comparison. They get out gained on the ground in the air and first downs barely on time of possession. And that's when Tulane throws an interception The only difference is they didn't allow any points off of those interceptions or off of that interception, holding them to downs on that series. But it just goes to show you how important starters are to a a team. So the Tulsa scores a touchdown. It was their first pass completion of the day. They're now at this point, they had Braxton, Braxton Braylon in for a series. Then they switched him out for Francis. They kept switching these guys out every other series and This was just kind of one of those bad drives for Lance Robinson, who has otherwise had really good ball skills. He did have a really good pass breakup on an incompletion on that series, but you've seen Tulane in in a lot of off coverage this year. And unfortunately, you just don't have the size in a guy like Lance Robinson that you do in Jarius Monroe to always be able to do that type of press coverage. And I did catch the anchors coach at one point telling these guys to play the ball. Uh, Tulsa was taking deep shots. They were taking every shot they could downfield with a quarterback that, and just got better and grew more confident as the game went on. And you can either crumble in those situations or you could try to keep picking the ball off. And that's really what Tulane's defense decided to do. Then this is kind of where Tulane started trying to scheme up things a lot, where this series was the first one they punted where you didn't see O'Keefe Brown or Lawrence Keyes in, and you wouldn't see them for the rest of the game. You instead saw them run out Dante Fleming, Bryce Bohannon, and sub again those tight ends and keep them in 11 personnel. 12 personnel. And then in one play that series, they at least tried with 21 personnel where they had uh Shedra Lewis motion out and keep Makai Hughes in the backfield. You saw later in the game, a really good downfield block by Hughes on a play where him and Shedra Lewis were in, 
You did see them get Shedra Lewis going as a runner and as a kick returner and as a pass catcher in this game. And you also saw Makai Hughes get a pass out in space as well. So I don't think all was lost in this game. And it was really necessary experience, I think, for some of these receivers like Bryce Bohannon, who at least you feel like you can build off that. I noticed how good Luke Besh was as a downfield blocker. And there was a pass or two that he might have been able to catch as well. He was able to get separation with good use of hands at the line of scrimmage. So you saw a little bit of promise but it was just a really steep hill to overcome. And then uh, on that series, there was a pass dropped by Dante Fleming that he just frankly should have caught. Uh, he's just a little undersized to me. He's a smaller guy. And those types of routes where he did have the guy beat in coverage, if it's Lawrence Keyes or it's Jaquan Jackson, they're probably making that catch every single time. But even just a little bit of timing being off with all of these changing going on as receiving weapons, it makes it really, really difficult in order to get anything done. Um Tulsa goes, they score a field goal. And I, I noticed on that play that they were running or that series, they were running quite a bit of tempo it was making it difficult for the defense to be able to make any subs. Once they were able to, they were able to hold them on two back-to-back -back incompletions. Then again, Tulane's offense punts. They hold Tulsa to three and out. And then Tulane throws an interception. So it really was just a downhill slip from there where, there was an incompletion again on that drive and Dante Fleming kind of slipped in place. Then that was the one penalty. And I will shout out Tulane because this was the one penalty that they had all game. It was a holding uh, call on Cameron wire that put them in a two and 20 position. And he was throwing to Bryce Bohannon. It's one of those plays that should he have tried to kind of bat the ball out of the defensive backs hands, probably a little bit. It was just a great read and diving catch by Tulsa uh, again, just, really giving uh, Tulane their best shot in every level of the field. Then the defense holds them and, and turns the ball over on downs with an incompletion on fourth down. I mean, the defense was doing what it could. The offense just really wasn't able to get it going at that point. And then you maybe had a chance on that final drive. Uh, that's where you saw the pass thrown to Makai Hughes. He got out of bounds. And then Cameron Wire got injured on that play. They had to bring Matt Lombardi in at left tackle. That's just a ridiculous amount of turnover at that point. So yeah, going into halftime, it's not necessarily what you're loving out of a football team, but it's one that I think can be explained quite a bit away by the context of injury. Uh, and the same goes in the second half, which I'll get to in a second. But as much as we talk about these third quarter starts for Tulane and these fourth quarter starts for Tulane, and I mean, at some point, I just feel like we're getting away from the idea of winning the football game. It's easier said than done, again, to make these types of adjustments when you're just this banged up on offense and you have guys out there trying to make catches like Blake Gunter and Luke Besh who haven't even been out there all season long. You've at least seen Dante Fleming and Bryce Bohannon be out there for a couple of series, but I, I think that the last catch by Dante Fleming was against Nichols, and that was in week four. And Bryce Bohannon having one catch all year, those are your options. I know that Chris Brazel was out there quite a bit, but he very quickly got wide receiver one treatment and was just blanketed in coverage at, at every point thereafter. But this defense, all things considered, save for a few explosive plays here and there, they held them in critical moments. They made those third down stops when it mattered. And most importantly, when they ha committed their only turnover of the game, they held them. And that made a huge difference going into half where you get a huge burst in your third phase of the game in special teams. Now, if you're watching the video version of this, you've probably noticed me looking down here and there. I have been trying my best, again, to chart a lot of these drives and these plays for Tulane just to be able to provide some context, again, when I'm going back through games. Because when you're on the sideline, I feel like I'm not really processing the game in real time. There'll be oftentimes I go up to the press box at the end and I have to look at Steve Berrios, uh, the color analyst who I host a post-game show with. And I'm sometimes like, the heck did I just watch? Because... It's just really hard sometimes in real time to conceptualize everything that's going on. I'll say all that to say, I started ch charting this pretty fastidiously in the first half, just because I was really curious to get a sense of the personnel that Tulane was running out there. Uh, you saw Reggie Brown's usage, I think, skyrocket in a way that you usually see Chris Carter, I think, split the time with him. Alex Bauman sp stepped up to me in a massive way in this game. Uh, and again, at wide receiver, you're running out sets that it was oftentimes uh, and they were running a lot of 11 personnel, I think, with the idea of trying as best as they could to scheme open these guys. And a lot of that 11 personnel was Alex Bauman lined up as a receiver, oftentimes in an empty formation with Shedra Lewis lined up as a receiver as well. It's just really hard to scheme open guys that 
really just haven't gotten a lot of meaningful playing time up to this point. When that 11 personnel is Bryce Bohannon, Dante Fleming, and Chris Brazel, it's a lot different than Lawrence Keyes, Jaquan Jackson, Chris Brazel, Yo Keith Brown, and Chris Carter, for that matter. You add Alex Bauman into that mix. That's really your, your pass catching foundation, if you will. And Tulane just didn't have that in this game, especially after the first quarter where you lost Yo Keith Brown and Lawrence Keyes. Uh, so to start the third quarter, you get the huge boost from Shedra Lewis, incredible downfield blocking by Tulane. They practice special teams every single day in practice. Really, I think a lot more emphasis on it than most teams do, but it pays off every single week for Tulane and it paid off in a massive game where Tulane's offense just really was having trouble getting it done. I'm always curious because I don't go in the locker room at halftime, you know, what's being said in there. And for me, this game was just kind of a get the heck out of Dodge and try to get healthy for next week because you just kept dropping like flies in this game. Um, you know, Tulane had a 14-0 uh, first quarter. They were outgained 10-0 in the second quarter. They were then, no, I'm sorry. They gained seven in that third quarter. That was the only points they scored. Tulsa kicked a field goal. And then Tulsa had a, a field goal, a touchdown, missed two-point conversion in the fourth quarter. And Tulane only scored a field goal. So 12-10 to 10 second half output. I mean, a defense that's allowing on average 10 points a half it is a good defense. Uh, everything else aside, it's a defense that you cannot run against that every team has to pass against. And yeah, sometimes that ends up being uh, explosive plays downfield. And sometimes it just doesn't end up mattering. And I think that's what you're really seeing for Tulane here. All that to say, my charting got relatively lazy in the second half because I just, again, think that really was, let's just get out of this with a win. We are not thinking about style points during the week in a game, in coaching. It's just not a thing to me. Uh so that, you know, Tulane possesses the ball out of half. They immediately get this huge burst. And then they end up punting on Tulsa's end. Even though they ran nine plays, they only got 31 yards out of it because after they got down the field, they had a tackle for loss on a run by Devin Deal. And then Tyler Grubbs sacks them on second down. They're on third and 21. And DJ Douglas was in uh, coverage, I believe, for that play. But it was an incompletion. I think it was actually thrown wildly out of bounds. Either way, huge clutch play after what you saw of them out of the first uh two quarters and then Tulane goes three and out on offense and punts again uh incompletion on third down to Chris Brazel but you just saw them really emphasizing running the ball just not working that well uh Tulsa kicks a field goal on the next series they had a huge 51 gain uh 51 yard gain on the pass play and really what it was was Jarius Monroe quite frankly and, and most of the defense was fooled by the play action and all of the motion to the the runner running to the right side. You just saw everyone follow him. And then all of a sudden this guy, I believe Ch uh, Benjamin for them is just wide open. And then they have back-to-back -back explosive plays on that drive where they have a 51 yard completion, then a 14 yard completion and a 10 yard run. Then they hold them. So again, you're seeing these explosive plays, but then you're seeing Tulane hold on clutch third down moments. Again, another incompletion. They kick a field goal. It's 21 to 13. This is still a very comfortable lead for Tulane. Then the offense punts again. And I mean, now you're seeing guys like Blake Gunter and Luke Besh out there as your, really your options. Uh, Dante Fleming had his first catch of the day on third down. He had an incompletion then later in that series on third down. So it's just so much inconsistency. And then you get to the fourth quarter. So if you're talking about third quarters for Tulane, all things considered, they did a lot better in the third quarter than they really have all year. Yes, they were outgained in the fourth quarter, but again, it just never really seems to matter. I mean, to a Tulsa, again, they punt after Lance Robinson had another pass breakup on third down. You were wondering then, okay, is Tulane going to go in and do their signature fourth quarter drive to end the game now? Then they go three and out uh, and end up punting and only possess it for a minute and 21 seconds. That's where you saw Tulsa's touchdown happen. Uh, and what ended up happening again, another explosive play, DJ Douglas took a bad angle. Then they threw to their quarterback Bra uh, Braxton, which was just wild. I mean, kind of reckless. If you ask me, I guess when you have that many quarterbacks, you can afford to get away with it. He then throws a touchdown pass and then they make the two point stop. So for Tulane, and if you've looked at the way that they performed in these last couple of games, they make the stop. And that's the end of the game for them. Then they get the ball back. They run in seven plays and end up turning the ball or ending the game on 
kneel downs and possess it for 258. Uh, looking at the time of possession in that quarter, they still held the ball for nine minutes. It's definitely not the same dominating output of the last couple of games. But when you consider, again, all of the injuries to this team that I went through and ones that were happening in real time for this game, you had a huge third down conversion on that final drive, a 10-yard reception by Chris Brazel. Not the first time. It's probably the third or fourth week in a row, and I've made a point to mention it in the postgame show each time, that Chris Brazel has made a really key third down conversion when it mattered. And then Makai Hughes breaks great free for 31 yards, all but ends the game. And what does he decide to do? He falls down inbounds. There's a strong chance he could have taken an angle and gotten a touchdown on that play. Uh, at that point, I was kind of making my way up, so I really couldn't see it hard to tell in the broadcast view and it's hard to tell what angles in space players that are relatively far downfield are going to take uh there's certainly a chance that he gets them a lot further upfield then you aren't really able to run out the clock in the same type of way or he gets out of bounds or gets you know tackled out of bounds but rather than add to his stat sheet he takes uh, just a complete slide down this team is team first it is nothing about individualizing and they made it basically mathematically certain with one timeout remaining for Tulsa that they will be able to kneel down the ball and end this football game. And Tulane has now done that so many weeks in a row running that it is a signature, even though this one wasn't the same seven minute domination that we're used to seeing. And I think again, I could keep talking about these injuries to run blue in the face and people that are kind of upset about the way this team is performing are going to kind of bark back at, you know, the last couple of weeks of play and I mean, here's my thing. This team is nine and one. This team is nine and one following the single season greatest turnaround in college football history, a program that was one vote away from dismantling their athletic program entirely after voting to leave the SEC. Haven't seen level uh, that level of success in 83 years. And now they have an opportunity this year to win 13 football games and Correct me if my, I'm wrong. I don't think that's a feat that's been reached yet with the addition of the conference championship. Again, they are off to a better start than they are than they were at this time last year. You can argue the quality of opponents till we're blue in the face here. I'm going to just keep pointing back again to if we're going to talk about quality opponents, Tulane had two losses this time last year. You could argue one of those was quality. The other was to a poor Southern Miss team who they beat this year. I don't care that Ole Miss beat or Georgia beat Ole Miss. That is a quality loss and that matters. And that's Tulane's only loss this year. And despite all of these games feeling like they're coming down to the wire, there has never been a moment where Tulane has really lost control of a football game. And that is to take into context onside kicks, interceptions that are returned nearly for a touchdown, losing all of the guys uh, among the offensive line, at wide receiver, losing all the guys to the draft the year prior, having almost every coach on this coaching staff be either moved to a different position or be in a new place, it all goes back to Willie Fritz. It all goes back to this one and no mentality. And this is what sustaining success looks like. Uh, I mean, we could be complaining about being on the outside, looking in, not being in control uh, or truly not being in control of their destiny, which they weren't at this point last year. They are the highest ranked G5 team. They're 17 in the AP polls. They moved up. After that game, that signifies to me that pollsters are watching, have somewhat of a context about injuries. And again, the teams like Air Force, where they were expected to have kind of that inside track, well, they've now blown it. And Tulane hasn't. That's what matters uh, at the end of the day. And, you know, we are in the midst of witnessing history here. And it just kind of feels like everyone uh, is just the talk is so concerned about things going wrong that I don't feel like we're really savoring the moment here where to, uh, Willie Fritz has shown the ability to sustain success at every program he's went to. I did a podcast earlier before the season started about this, but this ride's going to end. I mean, you have Michael Pratt. He's going to the draft next year. He's going to the senior bowl. And whether or not Tulane go looks within, whether or not they go to the transfer portal, it it's just not guaranteed. And I mean, it's never guaranteed, even when you have your starting quarterback coming back. And there was a time where I, I think 13 wins after a 12 win season especially after the two and 10 year just seemed unfathomable for Tulane. I mean, there's still a small private school in the group of five in this age of NIL and transfer portal. And what you've seen, I think is Willie Fritz's flexibility and adaptability and embracing of these new times makes such a difference. I mean, the NIL fear the wave collective has been such a key point of retaining the talent that Tulane has. And 
showing them that there is a pathway to the NFL at multiple positions on the field, at the most important position on the field. That's how you don't lose guys to the transfer portal. And to be able to continue to just push out these ridiculous running backs. And I think you saw Shedra Lewis's best game without question. And you said that about Shawnee Clayton Johnson last week. I mean, you just see a guy have his best game every week for this team. And there's only so much that I am going to afford myself to be jaded about in these victories where, again, momentum has switched, but Tulane's never lost control of the game. And things haven't been going their way. And it just doesn't matter. 1-0 is 1-0 for a reason for this team. And it, it's gotten them unbeaten in conference play. Now you're heading into week 11 where you just have to win two more games and you're in the driver's seat for a conference championship game. I think looking back, it's going to kind of be laughable how much these games were kind of looked at here and there because I think, honestly, Tulane played with their chips down a lot harder and a lot more complete in this last game than they have in the last several matchups. You saw a defense just kind of get exhausted for some stretches. And again, a few bad angles talking about this idea of injuries and, and opportunity and luck. Tulane has not been lucky. They have taken some bad plays to have pretty explosive consequences, and they've been able to overcome that every single time. A lot of teams allowing a touchdown late like that at the end of the game, it's just you almost assume the two-point conversion is going to be converted. Tulane holds them. This is a team full of new leaders, new coaches, new playmakers every single week, and they are finding a way to sustain the success and win every single week and get the community engaged. I just want to shout out again, the fan base for coming in the way that they did to this matchup. I mean, the student section was loud. People were in their seats and it didn't look that great about an hour before kickoff. I'll be honest, but the stadium was loud. I mean, there was a full start. They had to call a timeout at one point and that just can't go understated with how important this is. So Tulane heads out to FAU. It's Michael Pratt's hometown in Boca Raton. If you get one or two guys, I think back at either of those positions, either on the offensive line, although I almost feel like, again, they've proven their worth on that offensive line. But if you, I mean, you're, you get Chris Carter back. If you get one guy out of Lawrence Keyes, Jaquan Jackson, and Yo Keith Brown, that plus Chris Carter, you're still looking at just such a different offense than what you saw for this team take the field on Saturday. Again, guys that have not been out there taking a snap all year on anything outside of special teams were kind of the leading options there. So all things considered, this 1-0 is one that should not be taken for granted. And when you win in all three phases of the game like that and have that return for a touchdown and have those be able to help you out and have the defense be able to create turnovers and make stops when your offense makes the one turnover of the game to clean up the penalty issue from last week with the amount of turnover that they had. I mean, that is a game that is just primed for full starts, uh, you know, being still in motion at the snap. And you did see them move away from a lot of motion in this game, losing that personnel, which you also didn't have any of your jet sweep personnel for those types of plays either. I mean, talk about a menu just cut in half for play calling for Tulane, and yet they still managed to get it done on the heels of, again, an incredible performance by Makai Hughes. Very strong outing by Shedra Lewis and Michael Pratt getting it done in the air when he needs to get it done. Two guys like Chris Brazel and Alex Bauman and, and Bryce Bohannon being the leading receiver of the day just goes to show you how pound for pound this team is, and I think, again, how much needless worrying there is about style points that ultimately do not win you a football game. So with that, y'all, I will see you for FAU's uh, preview episode this Friday.